branches. And our next witness, Mr. Philip uh, Rossetti, is with us, a senior fellow at the R Street Institute, doing research on energy, climate, and environmental policies to include low cost and free market opportunities. Uh, all three of those witnesses are thoughtful and I think are going to give us good ideas today. And then I think it is a real pleasure to have uh, one of uh, Senator uh, Casey's uh, experts uh, uh, here with us, and he'll introduce our final witness. Mr. Okay. Chairman. Mr. Rossetti. Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, and distinguished senators of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today on the effects of the Inflation Reduction Act on energy communities. At the R Street Institute, we would say that uh, we would praise the intent of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, since we were one of the first free market think tanks to focus on anthropogenic climate change. However, we would note that the IRA's narrow focus on subsidies diminishes its effectiveness in achieving those outcomes. In our research, we found that much of the subsidies will go to firms that would have invested in clean energy even without the legislation. Uh, looking at just the electricity subsidies, which are the largest component of the IRA, uh, which are about $180 billion, we would estimate that two-thirds of that will go to firms that would have been investing in clean energy without the IRA. So that's $120 billion of investment without an additional climate benefit. Uh, importantly, the biggest claimants to these subsidies are going to be the wealthiest Americans because those are the biggest consumers of clean energy. One economist estimated that an American in the top 1% can expect about $11,000 of subsidy to them from the IRA. Effectively, this makes the IRA a wealth transfer from tax Americans to the subsidized Americans. One of the reasons that the IRA is so inefficient and it's distribution and, uh, and achievement of emission outcomes is because what's holding back clean energy is not capital availability. There are many people investing in clean energy. It's uh, permitting issues, it's siting issues, it's grid interconnection issues. Uh, last year, there was over 1,300 gigawatts of electricity generating resources and storage resources trying to connect to the grid, and over 1,200 gigawatts of that was low carbon resources. This is up 35% from the year prior. The process of connecting new resources to the grid used to take under two years. Now it takes more than five years. Our research at the Arstree Institute has found that uh, renewable projects are also more likely to incur, uh, require higher levels of environmental review in the permitting process. Uh, the Brookings Institute has found that Wind, ener wind energy projects and transmission projects take longer to permit than fossil fuel projects. Uh, and importantly, Princeton University found that 80% of the emission uh, benefits that could be achieved under the IRA are locked behind transmission growth. Uh, permitting reform is essential to achieving the emission outcomes that are uh, stated when it comes to this legislation. Uh, what we're seeing is that the biggest factor in actually siting and building new transmission is typically a factor, or excuse me, of a clean energy resource is typically a factor of transmission availability. Uh, it's a factor of the technical potential of renewable resources to generate power, uh, and it's not necessarily capital availability. So even provisions like extra subsidies for select communities uh, may not be the deciding factor in whether or not clean energy is constructed. It's also important for us to consider the full context of the United States fiscal picture whenever we're talking about uh, continued subsidy. Uh, we're expected to have about $1.4 trillion of deficit this year. If we were to close that deficit by simply having an even tax on all taxpayers, that would be over $8,000 per taxpayer per year. Deficits are expected to rise to $2.7 trillion by 2033, uh, and this is largely a product of the rising cost of servicing our existing debt. Interest payments by 2028 will eclipse the defense budget. In this context, the more we spend, the greater our debt, the more our interest payments uh, and this limits our effectiveness in uh, stimulating clean energy growth by just continued subsidy. Uh, importantly, we should acknowledge that the IRA was supposed to reduce deficits. However, the uh, rising cost of the clean energy subsidies means that that's less likely now. Uh, the jo Joint Committee on Taxation released an updated estimate of the clean energy provisions of the IRA and what it would save to repeal them, and they estimated $570 billion. Initially, the total clean energy provisions were estimated at $370 billion when the IRA was uh, initially scored. Uh, with that, it's important to understand that these tax increases in the IRA are also going to have an effect that countervails the, um, or counterweights the subsidy impacts. So we can point to specific communities that receive subsidy and say, 
they are benefiting from this however we also have to acknowledge that that is paid for by a tax increase on americans elsewhere even the corporate minimum tax in the ira we expect about half of that to fall on corporate workers and the tax foundation estimated that the net effect of the ira would be to reduce full time equivalent jobs in the u s economy by twenty nine thousand in short the ira has benefits but it also has costs these costs may outweigh the benefits and what's really holding back clean energy we would say are permitting issues and issues are not easily remedied by additional subsidy with i look forward to your questions thank you very much and thank you very much mr chairman and uh... mr simmons and mr rosetti i'd like each of you to respond to my first question uh, while some tout that the IRA green energy incentives are being transformational, others observe that non-tax roadblocks are serious impediments to widespread adoption and that the IRA will fall far short of its lofty stated goals. For example, a recent Princeton study found that 80% of the potential carbon emissions reduction from green energy projects funded by the IRA would be lost without significant expansion of transmission lines. Uh, to me, this gets into that question of permitting reform that each of you referenced. Please discuss this with me. How big of an issue is this with regard to the development required to bring a project online? And how big is the transmission line issue in this entire context? One thing I would add to that is, uh and when we look at NEPA and permitting and these issues, you know, you can have small projects that might get permitted quickly, but the really big impactful projects are the ones that are most likely to run afoul of long permitting timelines. Uh, what we see as a big factor in this is actually litigation risk. So the bigger the project, the longer it takes to prepare environmental, environmental impact statements. And it's not so much that the quality or environmental outcomes of the project are better with these long timelines, it's just that there's more ground to cover. Uh, so getting that done more efficiently, you get way more benefit uh, and you unlock a lot more investment. But also when we think about uh, this sort of idea of much more renewable energy and clean energy, the technical potential of those resources are in places like Texas, Iowa, uh, and there just is not the transmission to get them to the communities that would have the most demand for them. Well, thank you. And remember the long gas lines in the 1970s and how we were energy dependent to the Middle East. We have worked our way as a nation now to being energy independent and growing more and more diverse in our energy platform. But the Inflation Reduction Act seems to accelerate our energy dependence to China from the Middle East. Um, the reason I say that is the timelines and the dates that are set on this and the permitting requirements that currently exist and the incentives that are built in and quite frankly, even the Made in America requirements uh, that are in the bill itself uh, seem to be fudged throughout the entire bill. This seems to be the Chinese Inflation Reduction Act rather than the American Inflation Reduction Act when I look at it. Uh, the most basic element of this is pretty straightforward. If we're going to be at, at a point of electrification by 2035, all of this data that I've seen is we will need 300 new mines by 2035 to be able to meet the electric capacity just of getting the lithium, getting the cobalt, getting everything else, or we're going to be completely dependent on China. 300 new mines. Current processing now, we're somewhere between seven years and 15 years to be able to bring a new mine on board. We need 300 of them by 2035 to be fully operational, just the mining portion, not to mention all the rest of the production uh, that's engaged in this as well. So I, I do have lots of questions about this that I want to be able to walk through. Uh, uh, Mr. Rossetti, you, you had mentioned this issue about permitting reform. Mr. Simmons, you did as well on the issue of permitting at this point. You talked about the increased length of permitting projects and what's out there. Can you expand and talk to us a little bit about permitting reform and where that's going and what it would take to do 300 new mines just to be able to bring the minerals on board, not to mention the manufacturing? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so when we look at the mineral needs of the United States, if we were to go to an entirely net zero future, uh, they are enormous, and it's important to understand that there are also a lot of resources that we probably wouldn't be able to develop here in the United States because of their availability. Uh, the resources that we could develop would be a lot of lithium and copper, and the permitting process for that has been exceptionally difficult. So we look at uh, renewable resources and transmission resources, that's sometimes an entirely different game because uh, for minerals, you can't avoid the, uh, the footprint that's required. And as such, you 
always run into issues of um, endangered species. Uh, so the, um, there's an endangered species of buckwheat that's holding up a lithium mine. Uh, and it seems like there's not an easy path forward to say, okay, you know, how are we going to protect this species? Because there's not an easy definition of saying, what's the level of protection that's adequate? We know what the level of uh, listing a species is. We don't know what to say, okay, here's what's good enough. So uh, fixing that, I think, is something that could be done in a way that actually preserves the environment and helps to improve outcomes by uh, creating clarity on how to uh, be prudent in our resources. Uh, but to the extent that we're actually getting there, it has not been, we haven't achieved that yet, but there are efforts, absolutely. Well, there's Mr. Rossetti, there's a significant uh, backlog of energy projects that are seemingly shovel ready were it not for permitting delays. Uh, does this mean that a significant portion of the investment that the Inflation Reduction Act is supposed to incentivize would already happen uh, as of the result of market forces regardless of the IRA's costly tax credits? I'd like you to have you respond to that. And secondly, additionally, given this backlog of energy development and an already ballooning cost projection for the Inflation Reduction Act, do you think that enacting comprehensive permitting reform will supercharge the cost of IRA green energy credits to taxpayers? Uh, and if so, how, that's gonna, how is that going to affect the fiscal outlook for this country? Uh, to address your first question, the answer is yes, the market is already investing in clean energy and was before the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, every projection showed that, and you can just look at the investments, and that's where people were going. Uh, so I'd expect that uh, most of these subsidies in the Inflation Reduction Act are going to go to projects that simply would have claimed it anyway. Um, with, response, uh, with respect to your second question as to the rising cost of the subsidies, uh, because of the nature of the design of the subsidies in the Inflation Reduction Act, they will simply be claimed if you're eligible. So the more projects that can claim it, uh, the higher the costs are going to be. So when we look at the projections that CBO lays out, you know, they're going to be pretty conservative because they're looking at the EIA projections and these older projections saying, okay, here's where we projected to go. Uh, but what we see is, and what we've seen historically, is that those projections are usually pretty low. Uh, and as we update them, the num amount of clean energy is, uh, going into the grid is going up, which speaks to your first question, that the market was going this direction anyway, and that also increases the cost of the subsidies to the public. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Rossetti, uh, you talked about the wealth transfer of the Inflation Reduction Act. I want to talk about it a little bit. You know, we've been hearing an awful lot in this committee about wealthy tax cheats. Um, but the Inflation Reduction Act, it, it sets up tax credits if you make investments, correct? That's correct. And people that make investments have money, right? That is correct. And the ones probably most likely to make these kind of investments would probably be in the top 1%, correct? That is correct. And you're, in your testimony, you say that uh, on average, people in the top 1% will make, get about $11,000 each from this. I don't know how you got that calculation, but... Uh, that was from economist Jason Furman, who is the chair of uh, President Obama's uh, Council of Economic Advisors. But again, I don't deny that people are tax cheaters, but... I think as it's talked about in this committee too often, we're, we're talking about people that actually utilize the provisions in the tax code to incentivize a certain behavior to get tax credits to reduce their tax liability. So that, that's happening in this thing, and by and large, the people that are going to be taking advantage of these tax credits are people that are in the top 1%, and by the way, that probably would have been making the investments whether they have the tax credits or not. Is that that is my expectation. Let me okay. ask you this. We've got five EV manufacturers in Tennessee. And so grid resiliency is important, and EVs are important. And I've been quite surprised to see this huge, enormous, gaping loophole in the Inflation Reduction Act in regard to EVs in the $7,500 credit. It has led to such titles uh, or articles titled as how to save 7,500 on an EV even if it doesn't qualify and how to get a $7,500 tax credit on, on almost every EV lease. And that is language, Mr. Chairman, that needs to be cleaned up because what we've heard is that the Lincoln SUV is going to be imported from China. And so people will be able to exercise that credit on a less expensive foreign-made automobile and run it for the lease, then what are they going to do? They're going to go back to a gas-powered automobile because of cost. So 
have you all looked at this? Are you aware of this? Have you done any analysis on what this would actually mean? Mr. Rossetti, you might have something to say there. Uh, yeah, so when we think about the EVs, I, I think one of my biggest concerns with the EV tax credit as it was designed was that it's supposed to ostensibly have an income cap, but that income cap is so high that pretty much anyone can qualify. So when you look at who's buying EVs, it's predominantly uh, wealthy Americans. Uh, they're usually owning their own home. And then that's the, the structure of the subsidy. But when you look at where do you actually want to see more EV utilization, the subsidy is totally divorced from that. It simply rewards people for buying an EV. It doesn't reward them actually substituting an ICV. And we also have very little um, potential for benefit for people who might be living in apartments or uh, communal housing. Yeah, we hear yeah. about that quite a bit from people. There is not the ability to charge. And then, of course, when you have the brownouts and blackouts like we had in December, uh, people are quite concerned about what would happen uh, with, without the ability to get where they need to go. So thank you all. Mr. Rossetti, do you have a comment about this? Uh, yeah, so whenever we look at tax credits, there's no doubt that you know, it, it's going to benefit someone who claims it. But the question is, as opposed to what other policy? So when we look at the Inflation Reduction Act, my big concern is we probably could have bought a lot more benefit and got a lot more emission abatement and helped these specific communities with more refined policy that's targeted towards the barriers to market entry and capital investment rather than just saying, okay, we're going to have a new tax and then use that to pay for uh, additional subsidy. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing, and um, I will get out of your way.